direct from Detroit, USA. This is the only UK program to bring you detailed coverage of the 1998 North American Auto Show, the new VW Beetle, the new Aston Martin, a 4x4 based on a Ford Escort, all on Motor Week tonight. Well, if you've got outrageous muscle cars, huge trucks and crazy concept vehicles, it can only mean that Motor Week is coming to you from the 1998 Detroit Auto Show. the Millennium Bug had something to do with computers, then I've got a bit of news for you. Because here at the 1998 Detroit Motor Show, the world journalists are gathered to take a glimpse at the real Millennium Bug as Volkswagen unveil the new Beetle. about pricing because we know it's going to be $15,200 how much will we expect to pay when it hits the UK? Yeah, we haven't fully established pricing and specifications for the UK but as a guide I think you can take it that it'll be just slightly more expensive than uh, the equivalent engine Golf probably starting around £14,000. It's the people's car though it, you know, it, it was meant to be the affordable car for everybody to buy do you not think it's, it's a shame that it is so much now because it's, it's going to be out of most people's pockets really isn't it? The new Beetle is a different car from, from the old Beetle, it's uh, a new car for modern times. What it does carry over from the old Beetle though are the integrity of its structure, the safety, rigidity, um, reliability, those things that, that made the Beetle uh, a success in its day. It was quite extraordinary in the press conference. Um, there was an announcement made that it would be available here in the UK in spring, but it would be exported to the UK later in the year. Why is that? I mean, it's a European car. Why is it not being built in Europe? The, the new Beetle's primarily to re-establish Volkswagen's presence to the American market and if you remember in January 94 a concept was presented to the public. Um, it was a concept vehicle, a genuine concept vehicle, there was no intention then of building it and the reaction and the marketing studies were so positive that uh, the car is now going on sale. But why not build it in Europe? Is it just purely economic reasons? Is it cheaper to build the cars on this side of the world? Volkswagen actually builds cars and components all around the world and even the cars that are built in Europe might have engines, for example, built in China. So Volkswagen has production facilities uh, absolutely everywhere and um, it combines its products by uh, transporting components from one place to another and uh, it, it builds and purchases on, on a world basis. Now the reaction from the American media seems to have been incredible. If sales take off over here and if the, you know, the mar everybody wants the new Beetle, is that likely to delay the sale and the release of the Beetle in Europe? It might do a little. It depends on the ramp up of production and demand. And it's not only the American media. You know yourself that there are even UK media who've ordered the car, place orders. Well, Mike Rutherford thinks he has. I don't know, has he really? No, he was the first person to hand to me a written order for a new Beetle, yes, when it was announced that it went on sale. And there were several other members of the media who were right behind him as well. That's most unusual. Well, can you add me onto the list, please, Paul, from today? You're a long way down, you know. <laughs> the VW Beetle has been one of the strongest images in motoring for around 50 years. The curvy car has a place in the hearts of its millions of owners and it will live forever as Herbie, the fun-loving star of the Hollywood films. But sadly, all things must change, even those that have sold well over 25 million. And it's now time to say goodbye to Herbie and hello to the new Beetle for the next millennium. A brother who may not be quite as cute as the original, but is certainly far better equipped to cope with the 21st century. 
and we'll be bringing you the full story on next week's edition of Motor Week. Now this is extremely significant or potentially significant because what you're looking at here is a humble Ford Escort. No, I've not gone crazy. This is an Escort platform and Ford have decided to build an off-roader around that Escort platform. They've called it the ALP, spelled A-L-P-E. Not quite sure what the E stands for, but that is American English, I suppose. Um, it seems to me that this car is very much in that Land Rover Freelander category. Just think about it for a minute. We have an Escort platform, so it's cheap to produce. It's small, so it puts it right in that Freelander category and it would give Ford a marvellous entry into that four-wheel drive market, that bottom-end four-wheel drive market, which has become so popular, what with the Suzuki's out there and now the Freelander. What you may be looking at here is an Escort-based four-wheel drive off-roader competing with the Land Rover Freelander, and who knows, an Escort-based four-wheel drive vehicle built in the UK? Now, how about this for the ultimate luxury car from Mercedes-Benz this time? This is a Mercedes-Benz concept car which they call the Maybach. This is some concept car, this Mercedes-Benz Maybach. You can actually sit in these rear seats and they recline fully as you would expect, perhaps as a first-class passenger in an airline. You, the, the rest go right the way up. You get TVs and videos in the back. There's a cocktail cabinet as well. So what do you find in the backs of the front seats in the Maybach? Perhaps your Atlas or a newspaper or some sweet paper? Oh no, how about this? A beautiful, beautiful writing set. If you're looking for an example of true American excess, look no further than the Chrysler Kronos. In a world where cars are becoming more understated, more environmental and more ergonomic, this stands out like a sore thumb. And if it's looks which are dominated by these huge aluminium wheels that make up half the height of the car, take your breath away, then you won't be disappointed by the 6-litre V10 that lies under the bonnet. Coming from the country that created political correctness, the Kronos breaks every rule. There, there is a, uh, a Chrysler concept car that I'm sure you don't remember, that if I didn't work for Chrysler, I wouldn't remember, but it was done 45 years ago in 1953, and it was the Chrysler Delegance. And we did several cars in that general time frame, K310 and Delegance, but they were classically done cars. I mean, the, the, back in that era, in the, in the 50s era, there was a classic, front fender that came back and then a rear fender that took over for that and came back. And they were just, they were beautifully proportioned cars and beautifully executed cars. Uh, so we took that as inspiration and said, well, how would you do that in a contemporary form? And that's what this is. It was done by uh, Osam Shikato, which is a designer that we got from uh, Toyota about four years ago. And uh, just did a wonderful amount of research and came up with this just magically proportioned car. Sure, it's a little larger than life. 21 inch wheels, I mean, that's pretty big. Why not? <laughs> Humidor in the centre, right? Your team, Jack, was responsible for designing this stunning vehicle behind us. How do you go about designing a concept? I imagine it's very different, say, to setting up designing something that's for product to go into production. Is it more exciting? Do you really have a, an open page to go at? Oh, sure. And, and that's exactly right, an open page. There's uh, no restrictions. Um, it's a chance for a designer to just really do whatever he's always wanted to do. And if his design gets selected, and it gets to this stage, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Is this actually your design or is it, one, is it the design of somebody within your team? It's a fellow in, uh, in, the, in my team. His name is Osam Shikato and uh, he came from Toyota about four years ago. And it's kind of interesting that uh, he'd pick up on something that is uh, kind of inspired by the, uh, uh, the Ghia show cars of the 50s, the uh, D'Elegance, which is uh, a lot of American history to that, but uh, he really captured the, uh, the feel of that car in this in a very contemporary way. Yeah, without a doubt, when you look at it, it's incredibly classic. The lines are, are very classic. But today's enthusiasts, they do want to know, they want the technology and the performance as well. So does it have that side too? 
Well, that's right. That's right. I mean, it's uh, it's not just a copy of a uh, classic car. I mean, it's the wheels are, are bigger. They're, they're, it's a very substantial look to the car. The, the tires, the wheels in the back are 21 inch and 20s in the front. It's got a V10 six liter engine in it. And so it's uh, very contemporary in the drivetrain and, uh, and that, that part of it. I think it would blow the cars of the 50s away, wouldn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> leave them standing. <laughs> yeah. You seem to have paid incredible attention to detail on it, just from looking around it. Could you tell me about some of the detailing? Well, that, um, yes, I'm glad you noticed that. It's, uh, you do a car and you run out of time and you, know, yet you, you still got to finish it. And that's really important for an icon-type car like this, mm -hmm. is uh, the attention to the details. And uh, we just, you just worked at it. And um, you know, like on the interior, we looked at um, uh, watches for uh, ideas for um, back dials and stuff like that for the gauges. And um, um, just, uh, you know, if you noticed uh, the, uh, the wheel centers on that, we thought, boy, it'd be really neat if those could just stay level while the car rolled along. We kind of joked about <laughs> it, but uh, it's, it does that, you know. When it rolled in, they really did stay level, didn't they? <laughs> yes, yes. I had my fingers crossed. Did you breathe a big sigh of relief? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> so what do you get if you cross the power and excitement of a sports car with a rough and rugged off-roader? Chrysler have the answer. The Jeepster. It, it was really an interesting challenge, and one that the designers themselves, uh, you know, put upon themselves as kind of a stretch goal to see if they could come up with a new idea. Uh, a lot of them drive sports cars in that studio. One of them is a, has a sports racing Alfa Romeo GTV and uh, they just uh, love that kind of a car. They also like off-roading, but well, the two don't seem to mix very well. Uh, so they came up with a car that, that had two suspension settings, a low one for normal road use where it's sitting down and a high one so you get all the ground clearance that you need when you're going off-road. Uh, they put it together initially as a two-seater. Uh, Mr. Gale asked them to do a two-plus-two on it. So they expanded the cabin a little bit, uh, made a drop-down roof on it, and uh, in the end, it's, it's really a neat-looking car. Say hello to the poor man's Boxster, the plastic Porsche. This is Chrysler's concept, the Pronto Spider, and Chrysler are calling it a pop bottle car. That's because it's made from the same kind of plastics as this, which means that it's very, very affordable and it can also be recycled. So if they ever do decide to make it, it could be a true E-type for the future, where the E stands for environmental. Well, the, the technology is going to involve a lot of invention. I mean, that's the road that any new technology travels. Uh, you, you see something that is initially in concept very promising. And that's where we are right now. This looks very promising. It's injection, injected molded, injection molded, easy for you to say, injection molded in large pieces, uh, inner and outer that are glued together in such a way that you form box sections that are the strength of the vehicle. Uh, but we've got to go through a, a process that, that confirms all of that, that makes sure that it's got the right amount of rigidity, the right amount of crush, the right amount of, of structure where it needs to be structural and, and collapsing where it needs to collapse. Uh, the right amount of resistance to sun, to resistance to cold, resistance to all these various kinds of things. Uh, and, and we're in the process of doing that. I mean, it, you're saying that this is truly the affordable sports car. I've, I've called it the the e type for the next millennium, where the yeah. E stands for the environmental, really. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, but how, how affordable will, <clears throat> it, will it be? I mean, what, how much would, do you think this would cost? Uh, the savings come from a number of places. Uh, just in, in the plastic body, which is primarily what we're talking about here, uh, you're saving from a manufacturing standpoint a huge amount of the assembly plant. Uh, right now the assembly plant has this vast area that's dedicated to making the metal body not corrode. So you've got, you use galvanized panels and then you have dip tanks that, that put various coatings on them and primer dip tanks and then you take it through a paint booth and you have all that paint sprayed on it. Then you take it to a baking oven where you bake and cure the paint. And, and basically all of that is gone. So from an assembly process point of view, you've just saved a lot of money. <clears throat> the paint itself that you use, you use, I'm not sure how many gallons on that car, but five, six, seven gallons of, of paint. And the paint is running anywhere from 80 to $150 a gallon. I mean, this is expensive paint. And that's just the paint, not the e-coat and the primer and so on. So there's a lot of money to be saved and a lot of cost to be drawn out of it if we can make this work. Just one thing, I mean, if I was involved in, in a crash, yeah. I think I'd rather have steel around me than a plastic well, let me Well, let me ask you a different question. Okay. 
Uh, if, if your heart went bad and you had an artificial heart put in, would you rather it be steel or plastic? Plastic. Really? So when your life really depends on it, you'd rather have plastic. Now, for the past few years, the luxury car sector has been dominated by the likes of Jaguar, BMW with their 7 Series, Mercedes with the S-Class, and Toyota with the Lexus. But one car which should also be in that list is Audi's A8, a car that has that perceived rarity value because you see so few of them on the road and still has that ability to turn heads. Now the A8 has been around for nearly four years now and personally I think it's a gorgeous looking car and there's one thing that Audi engineers and designers are very good at and that's coming up with hot versions of their cars. There was the S2, the S4 and the S6. Well now Audi engineers have gone back looking through their desk drawers at headquarters for that letter from the magical Audi alphabet, the letter S and this is what they've come up with, the S8. Now up till now the A8 range has consisted of a 6 cylinder 2.8 litre engine and V8 3.7 and 4.2 litre engines. Well now the S8 ups the stake considerably, especially in the power department. The S8 gets a whopping 340 brake horsepower engine, as well as being linked to that Quattro four wheel drive system, Tiptronic gearbox and the sports suspension. Now everything is pretty much standard on the S8 as you would come to expect on this sort of car. You get climate control, there's a superb sound system and you get satellite navigation as well. Although you don't get the conventional system we've seen before with a TV screen. Instead you get a little display on the dashboard which tells you the route. One other great idea though is this. The solar sunroof. Now what the solar sunroof does is there are solar panels in the sunroof, top of the sunroof here and on a hot day when the sun is shining, energy is stored up in those panels which then when you're away from the vehicle, the energy from those panels allows the climate control system to carry on working whilst you're away from the vehicle. It's absolutely amazing. Now the main rival for the S8 is Jaguar's XJR V8, but the Audi wins hands down in terms of accommodation, both for passengers and in terms of boot space. Now where Jaguar always claim that you can fit two sets of golf clubs in the rear of their cars, with the Audi you can get the 18th green in as well. So what's the S8 like on the road and how does it drive? Well let's see shall we, and enjoy. The A8 really is a radical car in design and concept. The body is all aluminium, or should that be aluminium, like the guy in the TV ad calls it, and the Audi space frame is unique too. The car is packed with safety features, front airbags, four side airbags, ABS and ventilated disc brakes, plus EDL, which is a traction control system. And of course, not forgetting the Quattro drive system, which makes this car so sure-footed on the road. The use of aluminium in car production has a very positive effect on environmental pollution and that means that 90% of the aluminium in this car can be recycled and that also makes the car a lot lighter which helps tremendously with fuel consumption. This S8 will return around 27 to the gallon at a steady 75 miles per hour which is excellent for a 4.2 litre and a V8. So what's it really like to drive? Well, you put your foot down and the power just keeps coming and coming and coming. It's a very, very fast car indeed. In fact, you have to be so careful because you soon find yourself going far too fast. The suspension is very good. It's a sport suspension on the S8 and it's firm but very comfortable ride. And also the suspension has been lowered by 20 millimeters uh, as well as firm anti-roll bars to reduce the body movement. 
For such a big vehicle, it has all the feel of a thoroughbred sports car. Handling is excellent, the brakes will certainly stop you, although I did find that there was a bit of softness in the start of the brake pedal, but once your foot goes down, don't worry, you'll stop okay. It is a very fast car though, 0 to 60 in just over 6 seconds, top speed limited to 155 miles per hour, and for me, you couldn't find a nicer way of getting from A to B and doing it in style, comfort and with speed. So, what is the main competition for the Audi S8? Well, really, the only other large sporting saloon on the market is the Jaguar XJR V8, and that's had a tremendous amount of acclaim, and rightly so, but for me, I really, really like this car. I've grown to love it over the past few days. And I think also the fact that you don't see many A8s out on the road, that adds to its exclusivity. I mean, let's face it, in some areas of the country, BMWs, Jaguars and Mercedes are almost 10 a penny. So what will an S8 cost you? Well, £7,000 more than the 4.2 Quattro Sport and over £10,000 more than the Jaguar XJR. So if you want one, get out your checkbook and write £62,000 in that little box and an S8 will be yours and believe me you won't be disappointed. Launched at Detroit is the long-awaited Ford Cougar. Batched in America is the Mercury Cougar. The European Ford version will be launched in this form at the Geneva show in March. Designed at Ford's European centers in Dunton, UK, and Cologne, Germany, the car draws on the chassis expertise of Ford's European division and promises much as a driver's car. The Cougar goes on sale in the UK in the summer. Prices are yet to be announced. This is Ford's Halewood factory on Merseyside, but will soon be a Jaguar factory. They've announced it will build its X400 model at Halewood. The new model, aimed at the BMW 3 Series and Mercedes C-Class models, will go into production in 2001, two years after the X200, BMW 5 Series competitor. Nick Shaler, a confession to make. You had a press conference, I think, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Anybody thinks that motor industry executives don't work hard? You're the man that called the press conference at 6 o'clock this morning, and I was the man that didn't turn up. Um, Slept in again, <laughs> I'm afraid so. So, uh, purely in the interest of research, uh, what did you talk about at 6 o'clock this morning? <laughs> That's about the corniest one-liner I've heard. Uh, what we talked about this morning was the fact that, uh, subject to final negotiations with the British government, we are going to proceed with the X400 uh, at Halewood, and Halewood will become the Ford Halewood plant, will become a Jaguar plant, 100% manufacturing Jaguar product, um, and uh, hence will come into the Jaguar family. And I think that's great news for Merseyside. I think it's great news for uh, uh, Britain. I think it's great news for Jaguar. Uh, and I hope it's going to be great news for a lot of Jaguar buyers around the world. More on that Jaguar story next week, as well as a closer look at this amazing Aston Martin concept unveiled at Detroit, the Vantage, only on Motor Week. <laughs>